News 8 presents Justin Elliker and Tony Harp in Vote 2013, Mayoral Showdown, New Haven. Hello and welcome. I'm News 8 Chief Political Correspondent Mark Davis, live in New Haven. And welcome to Vote 2013, the Mayoral Showdown, New Haven. Joining us for this hour-long debate are State Senator and Democratic candidate Tony Harp and City Alderman Justin Elliker, who is running as a petitioning candidate after coming in second in the September primary. Also joining us here this morning are fellow panelists Paul Bass of the New Haven Independent and Mary O'Leary of the New Haven Register. Now, the time given to both candidates will be balanced in today's debate. All rules have been discussed with both camps ahead of time. Now, our format is a little less rigid than most formal debates designed to promote as much discussion as possible about the issues facing the Elm City and the issues the voters care about. Now, in addition to uh, questions from Mary, and Paul, and me, viewer questions will also be included. Questions, uh, questions that is submitted on WTNH.com, our website, and our News 8 cameras on the streets of New Haven. Now, there's a lot of ground to cover here, so let's get underway. And uh, the producer says, I should go first since I'm the moderator, so that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> um, this is directed to uh, Justin. But all of these questions really are going to both of you, but we'll direct them that way. Uh, Alderman, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the violence and crime in New Haven, and there's been discussion about going to the legislature to see if you can get different rules about drinking establishments and what have you. Uh, what's wrong with the idea of having some form of the uh, stop and frisk uh, 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 statute, I guess it's not a statute, it would be a, um, a, city, a city ordinance. Uh, what, what would be wrong with something like that to try to ease things a bit? Well, well, first of all, thanks for having me today. It's exciting to be here. Uh, we already have a type of stop and frisk in New Haven. Officers have a lot of flexibility with uh, the people that they uh, stop and ask questions to and if there's something suspicious then the officer often has the legal tools to investigate more. But I think it's critical that we find a balance between respecting people's civil rights and being safe. And the stop and frisk policy that we've seen in New York is a great tool. Uh, however, uh, it's been pushing the limits on a, our ability to respect people's civil rights. And so I think that that balance and making sure that our officers aren't going too far and being sensitive to, uh, to people, particularly because people, by, the, by how they dress or how they look, uh, shouldn't necessarily be pulled over and stopped and checked out. So I think we need to find that balance, and I think so far we've been relatively good at doing that. Now what actually we need to do is a lot more to address crime. We need to rebuild our police force. There's already money available in our, in our budget to do so. And we need to address the roots of crime, which are investing more in youth programming in the city and implementing more uh, access and, and making sure New Haven residents have access to more jobs in this city. Senator Harp? Well, I actually think that we've had problems in our state with po police profiling. And one of the things that stop and frisk does is actually sometimes promote pr police profiling. And we really don't want to see that happen. Actually, in my discussions with Chief Esserman, he believes that we have a lot of the tools that we need and that we are actually employing them through community-based policing. I met with an officer the other day, and he had a list of about 50 people in our town that they've been actually tracking for the past three or four years. And what I believe needs to happen is that we've got to let these people know that we know who they are. We've got to actually bring them in and we're doing some of that with Project Longevity that actually targets people that may shoot. We've got to bring them in, we've got to give them options. Specifically, I've heard from every superintendent that we've had, we've just really had two in, in, since I've been in elected office, that we know who these children are, we know who their families are. We've got to wrap services around them, we've got to bring them in and help them to become contributing members of our community. We can do that through community-based policing and through utilizing our social services networks. And as Justin points out, we have done away with a lot of our youth programming. 
we got to assure that we have that again for those who might get into some negativity simply because there's nothing else to do. But the chief says he has the tools that he needs. We don't need stop and frisk. Right, Justin thinks he has something to add here. Yeah, so, so I, I disagree uh, with Senator Harp, and I'm a frequent member of, or, or participant in CompStat, the weekly police meeting. I speak with the chief all the time, and we do not have the tools we need. The chief and the mayor have asked the state legislature to give us more tools, things like a, uh, a nightclub tax so that we can increase public safety by hiring more officers. It's something that we proposed right. last time, right. and the state legislature was unable to pass that. Right. Well, you know, I just want to speak to that as well. The city already has the ability to have special taxing districts. As a matter of fact, we have all of them. All it really takes is a mayor who can build consensus and bring the club owners together and actually get them to form that district. I challenge the, the mayor to do that. When I'm mayor, I will do that. And the reality is that we have what it takes now. If we can't get it done through bringing people in and trying to build consensus, then we go to the state. And frankly, I've sent a letter to the leaders of the General Assembly asking them to raise what the mayor has requested. But I think before the legislature starts in February, we can get this solved with the tools we have. But what we are unable to do what we need to do to raise the revenue to ensure that the nightclubs are paying for their own security. It's something that was part of our legislative request in the last legislative session. And the legislature did not pass that. We need more tools and we need the support of our legislature, including Senator Harp, who missed an opportunity last time and now that she's running for mayor has decided that this is a good idea. The reality is that we already have the tools and if, if Justin understood what a special task district is, that's when you come together and you tax and you use those resources to actually pay for those things. We have that tool now if the mayor used the bully pulpit. Now, if the mayor can't get the club owners to come together and form this district, then yes, you go to the legislature, and certainly I support that. I've written to say, let's get a bill in so that we can consider it. But the reality is, we don't need it if you can build consensus. If Senator Harp thinks that we can get every club in New Haven that benefits from the, our youth and selling them alcohol and whatever else, if we can get every club in New Haven to agree, then I think that it's inappropriate for her to be mayor. The reality is the city needs to sometimes use a stick with nightclubs that are abusing the privileges that they have. You know, one, having one been a parent, we'll having been a parent, I know that there's a thing called a carrot and a stick, and there are ways in which the city can incent the clubs to do that using the current power. If it doesn't work, then you go to the legislature. But we already have the laws on books that allow special tax districts. I have a feeling we could go the entire hour on this topic, but uh, <laughs> that's good. Already. It's already. Uh, let's move on. Uh, our next uh, question goes from Paul to Senator Hart. I was kind of enjoying watching that kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why we like this looser format. You thought we were going to be sleepy. Today. <laughs> Tony, as you know, the biggest development project in downtown's history is on the planning boards right now, on the old Coliseum site. The developer in the city say that project cannot happen unless we get the state to agree to spend a lot of money and give permission to flatten out the mini highway that's there on Route 34 and reconnect the neighborhood and the street gig grid. This won't happen unless we get the state to come through. You've talked a lot in this campaign about your relationships with the governor and the legislature. A, do you want to make that happen? And as mayor, are you promising you will deliver that? Well, you know, I think it's really important that we develop the Coliseum side. It creates a great opportunity for economic development in our town and so I believe that we can get the governor as well as the commissioner, Commissioner Redeker, to sit down and use federal resources to actually do that. Now there was some competition this year around uh, the federal resources and there was a sense that infrastructure work needed to be done at the railroad, but I believe this does create an opportunity and I believe as mayor that I can get it done. I have the relationship with the governor, I have a relationship with Commissioner Redeker, and I believe this is a, a, a very important project for our city and it actually reforms the way in which we enter the city and makes it far more exciting and I will use my political capital to assure that it gets done. Uh, if, if I could respond to that, uh, Tony's talked a lot about her 
relationships at the Capitol. And the reality is whoever gets elected mayor is going to have those relationships because every politician that that is running for state office needs New Haven to get reelected. So those relationships will exist no matter what. <laughs> On top of that, what's more important when we talk about development and investment is that we need to make development more predictable in New Haven and be more welcoming and take politics off the table when we're trying to encourage investment in the city. Coliseum site is a great example. 360 State is another great example where developers feel pressure because uh, candidates are asking them for money for their campaigns in exchange for support and development. And this has been a history in New Haven. I've participated in public financing to take money off the table. People are tired of big money influencing politics and even developers are tired of politicians asking them for money as a quid pro quo for attention. Tony said herself, that she gives meetings to people that contribute a lot to her campaign. This is exactly the kind of politics that we need to get away from in our city. What I've really said is that I will meet with anybody and you know what I I have a, a history of being independent. People know who I am. I've been around for 26 years. They don't have to guess what I'm going to do and they know who Tony is. They know that Tony is independent. I participated in public financing. Actually, I actually helped to assure that we could have the democracy fund here. And the reality is that I don't think one has anything to do with the other, frankly. Uh, numbers of attorneys bundled money for you, uh, Justin, in your campaign, and they have influence and represent those same developers. So I don't think that you come to this conversation, frankly, with clean hands. The reality is that when it comes to development deals, that we've got to look at principles. We've got to decide, is it good for the city? Does the developer have the resources to actually carry the project through? Is the, um, will it create jobs for New Haven residents? Will it, is it, will it be sustainable in terms of the environment? We've got to look at principles and take personality out of it. And whether you're, you get money through the democracy fund or you get money through getting four and 500 people to support your camp campaign from throughout the city as I did, the reality is those aren't the ways that I will make my decisions. I have a history of being independent, Justin. And frankly, uh, when I look at this whole, I think this whole issue of the Democracy Fund is specious, frankly, and really doesn't get to the bottom line. If you bundle money, you bundle money, whether it's $370 or more. And frankly, uh, if you look at your campaign, it looks like there have been bundled dollars. So, so just, just to keep it moving, yeah, one more yeah. thought from you, Justin, and we'll move on. Yeah, so this. For, first of all, Tony says that she gives meetings to everyone. I tried to get a meeting with Tony three years ago when I was advocating for red light camera legislation at the state, and Tony did not answer my calls. So let's start by being honest, and I am available to every single person out there. I give my cell phone out to everyone. I am available, and Tony has a track record of not being available. The public financing issue comes up over and over and over in this campaign. And let me tell and Tony did not participate in public financing. She's taking PAC money, special interest money, and thousands of dollars from contractors and people that have a financial interest in the future of this city, the self-financial interest. She's even taken $9,000 from a group that defrauded the city. Uh, this issue is important. Why? Because we want a government that is efficient and effective and a government that represents the people and makes decisions not based on a developer that gave money to their campaign because <laughs> if you do that then you are going to have not the best person or company for the job but the one that donated to your campaign tony has surrounded herself and her top economic advisors are people like sal Brancati and tony avalon that have donated a lot to her campaign and have a history of corruption in this city it's time we move beyond corruption and have clean governments for the best interest of all New Haven residents. Right, we need to move on and get off of this subject. Let's, let's move on to Mary O'Leary with a question for Justin Ellicker. Well, I guess this is, this is something that um, Tony has brought up before, too. Um, I mean, she will say she has a lot of experience in government uh, as an older person and also as a state senator, and we'll point out that you've been an alderman for four years. So how do you convince people that you have enough experience to actually run a city? So first of all, t Tony doesn't have the right to all experience at the table. I've been a high school teacher, an elementary school teacher. I've been on the board of aldermen for four years. I was a diplomat in the Foreign Service for five years. Uh, 
I have the right experience, on the ground experience. I understand how this city works. And if you ask me any question about policy, I'll give you a straight answer because I've worked hard both on the high level issues of budget and the on the ground issues like how to get your street paved, how to fix the plowing issues that we have in our city. But more importantly, experience is not the only thing you need as mayor. Richard Nixon had a lot of experience and you see where that got us. We need a mayor with judgment as well. And the people that Tony has surrounded herself with, Sal Brancati, Tony Avalone, the fact that she's accepting contributions from these companies, and the fact that her running mate is now involved in a voter fraud scandal is very, very concerning. We need a mayor with the right judgment. I've shown I have that judgment, and Tony's shown that she has not. Senator? Well, you know, the reality is that you do need experience, and you need to know where to go in Hartford to get the resources that we need to run the city. I think that most people don't realize that nearly 50% of our budget comes from Hartford. And frankly, Justin has been to Hartford, he says in debates, on red light cameras. Well, very good. But, you know, one of the things that you need to be able to do as well is to build consensus. Justin had a trolley program. We were going to get the money to actually fund the trolley, and the reality is he started out with 16 votes on the Board of Aldermen and ended up with three, couldn't get free money to do something that he was advocating. And so he can't build consensus on the Board of Aldermen. Only one person who is a colleague of 30 is supporting his candidacy. And the reality is if you can't work with a Board of Aldermen that has to pass your ordinances has to pass your budgets, then you can't govern this city. I have been a person, frankly, that has built my career on building consensus, building coalitions, and that's something that is just not in the suit of uh, things that Justin knows how to do. And I'm really sorry, Justin, but you know, it's been proved out by your experience on the Board of Aldermen that's not your strong suit. You don't work well with others. So the, the trolley, so, trolley was the mayor's proposal, but more importantly, uh, Tony has talked a lot about how she has the endorsements of the Board of Aldermen, and therefore she needs to be mayor. Well, it sounds like Tony supports a Republican president because that president would get along with the Republican Congress. But I sincerely hope that's not what she means. We have a system of checks and balances in this government for a reason. We shouldn't have one group of people having control over everything. We need to make sure we're moving things forward in this city. And by the way, everyone that's politically active in New Haven happens to be a Democrat. I am a Democrat. I support the idea of increased youth programming, of jobs, of increasing public safety, the three priorities of the current Board of Aldermen. There's a wealth of areas that we can work together. We vote unanimously as a board on many, many things. But it's also important that we don't give the Board of Aldermen everything. And I'm concerned that if Tony gets elected, she'll do that. Let me follow up because uh, you brought this up, uh, Senator, with regard to the absentee ballot controversy. Uh, what direction do you give your campaign workers with regard to the collection? Obviously, a get out the vote organization, which you think is going to be a tight election, you want to get as many absentee ballots in as you can. But what direction have you given to your campaign with regard to, to that? Each and every one of my campaign man, uh, people who do absentee ballots were trained. They were trained, one, that you can help someone with the absentee ballot application, but you cannot touch that ballot once it comes to the individual. No one in my campaign has done that. As a matter of fact, the issues that I think are the ones that we need to worry about the most is that a number of people we've sent in applications for and the city town clerk's office has not sent the absentee ballot out yet. It's Sunday, the election's on Tuesday. The people will get their, perhaps, their ballots on Monday or Tuesday and it will be very difficult for them to get them in. This is a, a democracy issue and this impacts the ability of people to actually vote. That's what a democracy is all about. And that's what I'm most worried about. We've trained our people. Justin, did you want to comment on this? Yeah, the other so, guy who brought it up. So, so we, we too say do not touch the ballot. Uh, but more importantly, what most concerns me is that Tony, her running mate, is involved in this scandal. There is a woman on the New Haven Register on a video that said that uh, Tony's running mate uh, helped facilitate taking her ballot to the poll, or taking her ballot. 
there is another individual uh, in Farnham Courts that said that she gave her ballot to another, an individual that was paid $99 uh, according to Mike Smart's financing fees. It's deeply concerning that there is absentee ballot fraud and the fact that Tony continues to surround herself with people that have a dubious background is concerning for the future of this city. Did, did you want to make one more? Well, we I just wanted to say that, you know, first of all, these are all allegations. We don't know whether or not they're true. They're allegations by someone who, frankly, is running against my running mate. And I think that these things will all be worked out. And what I support is making sure that they're fully investigated and that we don't jump to conclusions before the investigation has been completed. And if there's wrongdoing, it should be prosecuted. That's what a, a calm, reasonable head would do when two people are running against each other and the allegations were brought forth by the opponent. All right, let, let, let's take a breath and we'll come back. Uh, and uh, when we come back, we'll hear from a citizen here in New Haven. Stay with us. And welcome back. I'm Chief Political Correspondent Mark Davis here uh, with the candidates for mayor of New Haven, Tony Harp, Justin Ellicker, uh, Mary O'Leary of the New Haven Register is joining us to ask questions here, and uh, Paul Bass from the New Haven Independent. And you, listen very carefully now. We're, we've got your back here always at News 8. We're the voice of the people. We're going to hear from someone, a real New Havener. Listen carefully for Constance Thomas Raza. How would you relate to the youth to help them to stop the violence and stop hurting each other and advance their own futures. All right, thank you, Constance. And I guess the volley goes to you, Justin. Yeah, it, I think this is a, is a question that we're all uh, grappling with as a city. Uh, first of all, I, I, I hosted a youth forum to talk just about youth violence. And so the question was about how do you relate to youth? I think that it's important as we develop policy to include the youth in the development of that policy. There's a lot of interesting ideas based on the youth's background. Uh, one of the things I hear consistently around the city is that our kids don't have enough to do after school. I was uh, walking door to door on Sheffield Avenue the other day and there were kids everywhere in the street uh, from ages three years old to 20 years old and consistently I heard from people what are we gonna get for these kids to do we need after-school programming and the question is how do we pay for it we need something for these kids to do around mentors being productive we have a lot of incredible organizations in this city solar youth the boys and girls club youth rights media that are already offering programs but are looking for ways to reduce their overhead and we have these beautiful schools we need to open up these schools right away, immediately, so that we can have more for our kids to do after school uh, and keep them, keep them not just busy, but keep them being productive and out of trouble. And I'll just add one more thing that ultimately every race has a beginning, a middle, and the end. A lot of our, our youth are in the middle of their race. We need to uh, uh, offer youth programming that, to keep them on the right track. But we need to focus on the beginning as well, investing more in early childhood education, mental health support in schools, character education, to give our kids the tools they need to be successful in life. Senator? Well, I th when I first came to New Haven nearly 40 years ago, New Haven had community schools. New Haven had this wonderful parade. It was a children's parade. And I thought, oh, this is a community that actually values children. And over the years, because federal funding went away and a lot of funding, we've been in recessions, we've seen Hill Cooperative Youth close, we've seen Latino Youth close, we've seen the Q House close, and everywhere I go, I hear about these programs, how important they were to people who are now adults, and what a difference it made in their lives to have those programs. And so one of the things that I did and have done as a state senator was to give New Haven dollars so that it could plan to rebuild those community centers. And there's $750,000 now available to begin to build that. But what I did as well, because I do think it's important that the Board of Aldermen be involved, I said it couldn't be a top-down initiative, that it really had to be an initiative that builds consensus in the communities and it had to be approved by the Board of Aldermen. So they're moving forward with that program and I think it's really important. The other thing that we've got to do is that we've got to really look at the, the school day and whether or not it's 
an adequate school day and modern. Most mothers work now. And so when children are dismissed from school at 1130, in the case of some of our alternative schools, and at 1 and 2 o'clock in terms of some of our high schools, it's a, basically a recipe for a disaster. A longer school day you're talking about. We need a longer school day, and you can combine resources with after-school programming. And you can also use some of our wonderful students in this town. We have students from Yale. We have them from Southern. We have them uh, from Albertus Magnus, Gateway downtown. We could combine work-study programs with our schools and find a, a, a low-cost way to provide an extension of the day that I think would help our city as well as help our young people and provide those mentors, pe young people who are doing positive and productive things in their lives. I think Justin has a thought on this in the Yes, yeah, so I, I agree with longer school days, uh, but I wanted to mention the, the Q House. Q House has been closed for 10, more than 10 years, and people have been asking for support for the Q House for years and years and years. And it, it, after 10 years, uh, Senator Harp decides to run for mayor and then sends uh, uh, some money from the Capitol to the Q House. We, we needed that money many, many years ago, and I, and I think that uh, it, it's uh, circumstantial that it happened at this time. Uh, when Senator Harp has decided to run for mayor. I think you want there to is about really that not a connection between that. The first money came last year before I even knew that I was even thinking about mayor. As a matter of fact, I just won for state senator. So that we sent the first planning dollars down last year. We sent the final amount down this year that is ongoing. The reality is that the Board of Aldermen was made a compelling case that we ought to have these kind of programs. And uh, I, I don't know, I don't believe Justin was at the meeting when they met with the delegation, but the reality is that's what they asked for and that's what we delivered for them because we see it's important too. Had nothing to do with me running for mayor. <laughs> so, okay. Sorry, well, Justin, The community on that has one. been asking for this <laughs> for 10 years. Let, let's move on to uh, Paul Bass from the New Haven Independent. Uh, question. Actually, I think they, they tell me the next volley goes to Senator Harp. Okay, okay. good. But the, most of these questions are to both of them anyway. Yeah. So. Tony, who's the best mayor in America right now? And why? You know, I don't know who the best mayor in America is. I wish I, I, I could tell you. I think that Cory Booker was a, a, a good mayor, and, um, and I believe that the people of New Jersey verified that by sending him to the Senate. He uh, was an intellectual uh, mayor. He um, basically got rid of a lot of the corruption in his town and he was able to institute policies that made a difference. So I guess I would say that he is the best mayor. So you would run into burning buildings and rescue children like Corey Booker? Well, if I, <laughs> <laughs> if I had a wetsuit and wouldn't burn, but yeah. <laughs> I'd like to say that I actually have run into build, burning buildings, but unfortunately I can't say that. Um, I, I think this is a great question and uh, Corey Booker's a great answer. I would choose uh, the mayor of Ithaca, New York. Ithaca has been facing a lot of similar challenges to New Haven, and there is a young, energetic mayor that has brought many new ideas, and uh, because he's been able to implement a lot of ideas in a town like Ithaca that is a university town, he's collaborated with the university to create a business district, which harnesses a lot of the innovation economy that we've seen uh, building in a lot of cities around the nation. I think that we need mayors in this city, uh, mayors in this nation, but particularly in New Haven, that bring that integrity, bring new ideas and new energy, and are able to move beyond this politics as usual. You know what struck me in Ithaca is, because I was spent a lot of time the last couple of years, is that you never lock your door and there's almost no racial diversity in that city. Is it a parallel? And it's much smaller. Is it a parallel to New Haven? I think because it's a university town, but obviously mm -hmm. New Haven's different than, I mean, uh, uh, Cory Booker's a quite a different example as well. Uh, New Haven's not, a, is different than every, every, uh, every city out there. Here's a quick yes or no. Uh, was Dan Malloy a good mayor? I think he was a good mayor. I, and, and the reason that I believe that he was a good mayor, one, uh, Stanford grew beyond uh, its expectation during his leadership, and he as well did 
a universal pre-K program that is the model for the state, the only city that's been able to do that. Justin? Ye yes and no. Uh, Dan Malloy has been effective at uh, er increasing early childhood education, at creating an innovative uh, er er a new district along the waterfront and harnessing, harnessing some of Stanford's, Stanford's uh, expertise. But I think that uh, similar to Mayor DiStefano, Dan Malloy's way of doing things is, is, is not as uh, focused on and gathering together community leaders and community members in the city. We need a mayor that listens in the city. I couldn't help myself on that one because my guess is he's probably watching. <laughs> <laughs> the next question comes from Mary O'Leary from the New Haven Register. And let's see, which way are we going here? That's to she's me, she's going to Justin, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have a very um, diverse workforce in City Hall. I mean, everyone's made a point of doing that and probably in, in industries across the city. But unfortunately, the city c continues to be a segregated city. I and mean, we have a lot of wards that are um, mainly white or mainly black. Uh, mm -hmm. And that has somewhat shown up in the um, results of the primary that uh, you seem to have gotten um, a lot of votes from uh, the white neighborhoods and mm -hmm. not so many from the blacks. And how, how do you uh, sort of bring that or close that gap if you can run the city? So uh, first of all, uh, I have received support from around the city. and. In the end of the election, uh, I have been working hard to reach out to every single person in this city. I don't just give my cell phone out to a certain group of people, I give my cell phone out to everyone and that's for a reason. Uh, when I get elected on Tuesday, I will represent every single person in the city because I'm a person of integrity. Some of my strongest advocates are my representatives in Cedar Hill. And they will tell you, and Cedar Hill is a primarily lower income neighborhood and is primarily non-white. They will tell you that I work alongside them, working on issues like urban blight. We've had problems with prostitution and crime in their neighborhoods because I care and I listen to people no matter what they look like, where they come from. Uh, and that's what I will do as mayor. Senator? Well, I represent the 10th Senatorial District, which is racially diverse. In the election, while I lost a few wards that Justin won, I got significant votes across the city. Uh, so I believe that I have a history of having worked with everyone, no matter their race, no matter their religion. And, uh, and they have counted on me over the years, and they know they can count on me. So uh, I don't think I have that problem, frankly. If, if, I, if I could add, uh, you know, there's been a lot of questions about whether race is an issue in this election. And race is absolutely an issue. Uh, I marched with uh, the Bereavement Care Network, uh, and the Bereavement Care Network helps out families uh, of youth that have been lost to gun violence. And of the 150, 200 people that were there, I was the only white person marching with them. And I think that's an indication of the problem that exists and the disparities that exist between races in this city. How do we address the issue is this question moving forward. We address it by treating everyone equally with resources, not people that are politically connected. And by giving more support to neighborhoods that are struggling. New Hallville, Dixwell, have had very little economic development along those corridors. Grand Avenue has had very little support from the city. By bringing up those neighborhoods and making sure they have more opportunities, we, everyone in this city can prosper. One more thought, Senator? Should well, we you know, I, I can't disagree with that. I, I guess um, what is, I have to sort of weigh and balance in all of this was Justin's trying to get a special uh, tax um, um, program through the legislature that would impact East Rock more than it would even Westville. So the reality is that while he says this, uh, as an alderman, and you know, frankly, I know that he was an alderman, and uh, the mayor brought it to us, and we all looked at it, and I thought at the time that it, it was even reasonable until I realized that it would actually have a negative impact on Westville. And so we have seen this sort of pitting of neighborhoods on the board of aldermen. One of the things that well, I want to do yeah, I is... We're going to have to let him rebut just quickly, Justin. You must have... Yeah, so yeah. Tony's talking about the revaluation two years ago where the mayor introduced a pro proposal. The entire board of aldermen supported this proposal. It was passed to the state legislature, and Tony passed it through the Senate. I said now, I did. now, why is she bringing this up at this point when she and I, I, and the entire board and the mayor were all on the same page? It's irrelevant to what we're talking about today. She well, supported it. I don't believe One that it's... thought on this. Go ahead. I, I don't believe that it's irrelevant. And I think that what you've got to look at is who's had the history 
of actually trying to weave the communities together who's worked with all of the populations. And the reality is this is actually something new for Justin. All right, let's move on just to keep things moving. Let's hear from a New Havener now. Uh, from a News 8 camera, here is Stefan Moss. Listen. When are they going to lower taxes? You know, everything is high here in Connecticut, like extremely high. And, you know, people have children that they have to raise, and, you know, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. All right, so, when are you going to lower taxes? This goes to Senator Hart. Well, the reality is that we're likely not to lower them. What I want to say is that I'm not going to raise property taxes. Um, right, because the city's got a big financial problem. Right? Well, the city has a, a big financial problem, supposedly. I know that we have uh, some problems with our pension, as does the state and other towns in our state. But the reality is that we can't afford to raise property taxes anymore. If we're going to develop our town, we've got to make sure that what it is we have is stable and predictable, because we know that that's what will make people invest here. So what do we have to do? We've got to look at ways in which we're being inefficient. One of the things that we do with personal property tax for businesses is that we let them tell us what they're going to claim and how much they should pay. It ought to be audited. I think we can find millions of dollars there, or at least a million dollars, which would make a big difference. Uh, we've got to look at other ways that instead of siloing our departments to find out where there are common types of activities that occur and have them build synergies together and actually um, get them done more efficiently. And you can do that by track, trash collection in the parks and in public works and combining those. And you can as well look at all of the ways in which we do our inspections. And I believe that there are ways that we can pull together task forces within the city to actually have a system that does inspections that is a little bit more efficient than we currently have and a little bit more effective. Justin? So I, I've been uh, on the Finance Committee on the Board of Aldermen and been one of the strongest advocates for cutting the mayor's proposed budget. Uh, what concerns me is uh, Senator Harp said we supposedly have a budget problem. And if we don't know, if Senator Hart doesn't know by now that we have an extreme budget problem, then that is deeply concerning. Wall Street Journal article came out the other day saying that New Haven has, is uh, of the top 10 cities, of, two, of 250 cities in, New, in, in the city, in the nation, New Haven is among the top 10 for, of debt per capita. New Haven is also among the top 10 with the lowest fund balance. We need to make dramatic decisions or we as a city won't have enough money in the future to pay for paraprofessionals, teachers in our schools, etc. And I've been honest about the fact that we need to readdress our pension problems because it is a problem. We're underfunding it by $440 million. So I've been talking about moving top level employees from defined benefit to defined contribution. A difficult thing to say politically but something that I think we need to be doing. I want to add one more thing. It's important to pay your taxes. The state has a fiscal disaster in front of it, and Tony's family has not paid over a million dollars in taxes to the state. It's time that we, as uh, representatives, take responsibility for ours and our family's well, actions. I had a feeling you would bring that up. Uh, you said a million dollars would make a big difference in the city. Uh, you have deflected questions about your late husband's tax delinquency, saying you had separate careers, and I think a lot of people accept that. But if you are elected on Tuesday, you'll become the chief executive officer of this city, and you have a, a, a right, you have the duty to every taxpayer. What will you do? That business is now run by your son. What will you do to make sure there's no unfair treatment and that that is pursued just like every other delinquent taxpayer? You know, I am the only candidate that has an ethics uh, policy that basically says that no one will be treated any better than anyone else. So if you go online and look at my policy, you'll see that that applies to my son's business as well as anyone else's business. But I think it's really important that you ask that question about my husband's taxes. First of all, let me say that I love my husband. I love my son. I believe that my husband contributed a lot to this community. And I believe that this tax issue has been misrepresented. You know, my husband's tax issue had to do with how he allocated employees over a number of businesses. It wasn't really clear. He got advice from 
accountants, he got advice from lawyers, and he took the issue of allocating his employees all the way up to the Supreme Court. It took eight years to do. By the time it got resolved in the Supreme Court, he was negotiating with the Department of Revenue Services, and unfortunately for our family, he passed away. My son inherited the business. He and his lawyers, as we speak, are meeting with the Department of Revenue Services to resolve this issue. He has assured me that it will be resolved. It's not my personal taxes. It's not our property taxes or my property taxes. It is my husband's business taxes and how he allocated his employees across his many businesses. My son, who's inherited the business, is resolving it with the Department of Revenue Services, he and his attorneys and accountants. I don't think so. We so as a, a homeowner in New Haven, I find it hard to believe that anyone could run for mayor with the tax background that Senator Harp has. At every level of government, for five years, she didn't adequately pay her federal taxes and at the same time donated $5,000 to her own campaign. Her family owes the state $1 million plus dollars and it has not been resolved yet. And, until, and I think she needs to take responsibility for it. I don't blame her for trying to protect her family, but a mayor cannot ask people to pay taxes if they don't take responsibility for their own taxes. And even at the municipal level, she lives in a home that did not have a certificate of occupancy for over 10 years, did not have a building permit, or had, did not adequately a estimate the building permit, owes, owes about over $10,000 in building permit fees to the city. How can anyone expect to be mayor and expect to ask residents to pay their taxes if they're not responsible with their own? I'm sure you well, want you know, to frankly, that. I do want to rebut it. You know, actually, Justin doesn't own his own home. His wife does, according to what we've seen uh, down at the city town clerk's office. So, um, and no one has gone into uh, what it is that she does. I'm the first woman who's run for mayor who is has to stand for her spouse's business problems. The reality is I worked as a professional at the Cornell Scott Hill Health Center for the past 26 years. I've been a, a, a legislator and co-chaired the Appropriations Committee, frankly the hardest working committee in the legislature, for the, for the past 10 years. And the reality is that I am my own person. You know, he's talking about personal taxes that I had a problem with over a decade ago, over a decade ago. So he's talking about a, a certificate of occupancy that was actually granted in the interim that frankly the city lost. My husband died, they lost it for 10 years. There is too much red tape when it comes to building in our city. That needs to be fixed. That's what a mayor should do. And so yes, as a woman, he's asking me questions that as a man have never been asked to him. And you know, frankly, I don't think that it is appropriate and I think it, I think we all know what it is. But the reality is that uh, I don't know any taxes now, that I didn't file when my children were in, uh, in college and uh, you know, I don't have a problem. That happened decades ago. That was almost a generation ago. So I'm clear that what it is that my family has done, what my son is doing, is taking care of his problem. And I commend him for it. It wasn't that easy. But the reality is, I don't know taxes, haven't had a problem, uh, have filed on time for the past 10 years, and he's just digging through all the kind of garbage that he can to run the, the negative campaign that he said he wouldn't run. We have to call a break. We have to call a break. We have to take a break. Uh, we'll be right back uh, with more of your questions coming up. Stay with us. And welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Chief Political Correspondent Mark Davis, along with the candidates for Mayor of New Haven, State Senator Tony Harp and Alderman Justin Elliker, and our panelists, Mary O'Leary from the New Haven Register and Paul Bass from the New Haven Independent. Now, in this segment, we're going to be a little bit more careful on time because we want to save a minute for each of them to address you directly at the very end of this program. So now we move over to Paul Bass with a question for Justin. Justin, the mayor of the city of New Haven has proposed that immigrants who are here legally but are not citizens get the right to vote in municipal elections. Elected, are you going to support that? No. 
uh, I, I would love to say that I could support it. What I can support is uh, engaging everyone, no matter what their citizenship is, in government. Everyone in this city deserves a voice. And uh, I have actually a lot of people from the immigrant community uh, helping out with my campaign. And similar to many people that aren't politically connected in this city, from every neighborhood, people feel like their, their government doesn't respond to them, doesn't address their issues. Government needs to be responsive and helpful to everyone, but citizenship is the basic right, uh, or voting is the basic uh, foundation of citizenship, and I would not support that. Senator? So, uh, actually, citizenship really does have to mean something, and the reality is that if we all have our own citizenship rules, that it really undermines citizenship in our country. So. Uh, I would not support that either, but I would assure that there's full participation on boards and commissions, as Justin has indicated, and throughout the life of our community, and to find ways to show that we value these folks in our community, that they are, they are important to the life of our community and bring vitality to it. So uh, those are the things that I would strive to do as mayor. Okay, next question comes from Mary to Senator Hart. Uh, Tony, you talked about a lot about, I mean, you've been in a very powerful position in the state on the Appropriations Committee. Um, there are state policies that really uh, injure New Haven, essentially, uh, the uh, tax exemption, problem, exemption problems. About half of the city's grand list is exempt, which makes it very difficult to raise revenue here. Um, the pilot program that was in place, I mean, during your tenure now, the, the amount of money that comes back to New Haven continues to drop. So that's one issue that people have said if it was funded fully, uh, New Haven would be in a very better position. And then tied to that is the pension uh, situation. You said that you would go to the state to ask for money uh, from them to help us with our pension plan. Um, how can you get that done with the problems at the state level? And why wasn't other things fixed, I guess, along the way? Be before we go to the system, you explain for the viewers, pilot means pi payment in lieu of taxes. That's what the state gives for non-taxable uh, institutions like Yale, what have you. Right. right. And, you know, for years we uh, have heard people say that we ought to tax Yale. And what they don't realize, they're just not a simple um, institution that has a tax status that is in the general statutes. They're actually in the uh, constitution of our state as not-for-profit. And so the reality is that as it grows, and it grows in other communities, our payment in lieu of taxes actually does diminish and so I think that what that creates is an opportunity for me to build consensus with the mayor of West Haven, the first selectman of Orange because University of New Haven is expanded out into Orange which means that pilot pot diminishes even though it's uh, funded, um, is level funded and I fought really hard to make sure that it was level funded and that we got our state pilot as well which was uh, eliminated in the governor's budget. So the reality is we ended up with more resources this year because I fought that fight. But I believe that we can uh, pull together the mayors and first selectmen where these expansions have occurred and those delegations and go to the General Assembly and get that pilot increased. I believe that's what it's going to take. You know, we've been in a recession. We're trying to act like New Haven hasn't been impacted by a recession. The state hasn't been impacted by the recession. But the reality is that we have, we're coming out of it. It's a great time for cities to get more of their share. I'm the person who can get that done. So, Dustin? Uh, over the 20 years that, uh, that Senator Harp has been at the Capitol, her position has continued to arise, and our pilot funding has continued to decrease. And now that she's running for mayor, all of a sudden her relationships from Hartford are going to help New Haven get all kinds of more money. Let's be honest about the situation. The state's finances are even more of a disaster than the city's. The, since Tony's been on a chair of the Appropriations Committee for 10 years, our state deficit has gone, uh, debt has gone from $20 billion to $30 billion. Recently, in a major journal, New ha or, uh, the state of Connecticut was called the worst economy in the nation. It is time that New Haven focus on and address our own issues. I have a specific plan on how to bring our finances back into check without 
pie in the sky ideas of how the state's going to send a bunch of money and West Haven's going to partner with us. We need to be specific about what we're going to do to address our problems. All right, we're coming to the final minutes of this program, and each of you is going to get a minute now for your final pitch for votes on Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Alderman Elliker, you're first. You can look right into that camera and talk to everybody in New Haven right now. Thank you. We are guaranteed a new mayor in this election, but we're not guaranteed a new way of business. And it is time. New Haven deserves a new way of doing business. New Haven deserves, deserves better. Someone that's been on the ground, that is honest about our fiscal situation, that knows how to address the operational challenges in the city, an executive. Someone that doesn't surround themselves with a bunch of big money from outside of the city, but someone that will be responsive to New Haven residents and has run the most honest campaign in this city and someone that's willing to listen to every single person in this city. I will do that because I am honest, I care about folks, and I have specific plans on how to address the many challenges and opportunities that exist in this city. I hope you're, I have your vote November 5th. You have excellent sense of timing because you were just right. <laughs> Senator Harp, you won the coin toss. You get the final word. I grew up in segregation, and now I'm running for mayor. I've been an elected official in the state of Connecticut for the past 26 years, and I've worked really hard on behalf of people. I am a consensus builder. I know how to bring people together. I do that every day. I form coalitions, and I get things done. I worked really hard to make sure that people had access to health care by expanding our health care to grandparents, to people who have children, through the Husky program. I worked to assure that 16 and 17 year olds weren't considered adults in our criminal justice system, but were considered the children that we know that they are. We know we need jobs in this town. We know we need a better education in this town. We know we need to have safe streets. I can build the coalitions that can get us there. I have the relationships in Hartford to get us the resources that we need. And I am committed to you. You know who I am, and I urge you to support me on November 5th. Thank you again for your excellent sense of timing. Now, I assume mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't have a ride to the polls, both of your campaigns would be willing to provide rides to do it on Tuesday, as is the norm at very well-run well campaigns. Thanks very much for being with us. Uh, the, the candidates for mayor of New Haven on Tuesday, Senator Tony Hart. Alderman Justin Elliker. Thank you to Mark. Mary from the New Haven Register and Thank Paul you. from the New Haven Independent. And if you tuned in late uh, and you want to catch up uh, with this program, it's available on WTNH.com and I believe it'll also be available on the, on the news uh, websites later on today. Don't forget to vote on Tuesday and may the best person win. I'm Mark Davis. Have a great day. <laughs>